Okay. Okay. Hey, I'm amplified. It's always nice to be amplified. Hello, people with Microsoft HoloLens headsets on. Are you having a good time? Are you turning me into Daffy Duck? Um, yeah. So, hi. Welcome to the end of NDC Oslo 2023. Have you had a good time? I'm going to take that as a no. Try again. Have you had a good time? Thank you. Okay, so the next time you can interact with the NDC crew and all these great speakers that you've seen is at the Copenhagen Developers Festival in August, which is a new thing that they're trying. So this is going to be during the, we've got some workshops going on there. Uh, we've got talks during the day, and then in the evening, they bring out the beer and the barbecue and the bands, and we've got proper music stages and sound systems and the whole thing. Um, but you can come along to that. You can bring your family. There's stuff uh, in the evenings for kids to do. You can bring your kids, and they can go and do gaming sessions and all kinds of mad stuff. Uh, you can find out about that at cphdevfest.com. And uh, you will be able to see these fantastic speakers. These are the speakers who were above the fold on the Copenhagen Developer Festival homepage. And that's, um, I'm sad. So I'm just going to stick myself on there as well. <laughs> Screw you guys. But the really good news is that because you have come to and paid for NDC Oslo 2023, you can get 50% off your ticket for the Copenhagen Developer Festival. You just need to email info at ndcconferences.com and they will tell you how you can get that 50% discount on your Copenhagen ticket. So do that. Come, it's going to be great. I'm going to be playing bass on a proper stage. I've been playing bass for like all of seven months. And uh, I'm going to be playing bass uh, live on stage. I'm kind of excited. Um, and Heather will be singing. And uh, Dylan and, and people. And, and then other actual proper bands and everything. OK, we've got some prizes to hand out. Uh, so we got two of the raffles from the conference that we're going to draw now. And so first up, we have uh, Cloudworks. And so if you'd like to come up on stage and here's the microphone, say a few words. Please give it up for Arn. <laughs> hey, everyone. So here at Cloudworks, uh, we do all things identity, experts in both uh, competency and systems. We had a challenge for anyone stopping by our booth to go hunting for white rabbits both here at the conference and on the internet, with a total of 13 rabbits, each with a little bit of a uh, um, uh, web token to, uh, to collect uh, and uh, deliver to us. A complete token gave an entry into the raffle. Not too many were able to complete this, but this is, of course, uh, a star on your LinkedIn page is completing our challenge. So perhaps you, Mark, can uh, do the honors of uh, picking one. For the record, he has not entered. Yeah. The winner is Jorn Henning Larsen. Are you here? Jorn Henning, yep. The uh, prize was uh, a collection of Cloudworks merchandise, but probably the most significant thing there is a pair of Apple AirPods. Unsure if they're Cloudworks branded, but they should be, in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Round of applause. I should have entered. I want some AirPods. OK, so next up we have the, uh, if there is a representative here, uh, we have Vonage. Is a, there he is. Vonage are giving away the Batman Tumblr. I didn't enter this because I actually got this for Christmas. And that is such an awesome model. Uh, that is really, really fun to build. So do you want to say a few words? I would love to say a few words. Uh, so I am known as the representative from Vonage. 
Uh, my name is also Benjamin. I'm a developer advocate at Vonage. If you didn't have a chance to stop by the booth, um, Vonage, it, what we do is we empower developers through our communication APIs. Uh, so why reinvent the wheel every time you need to build out SMS or voice or video or authentication solutions? Think of Vonage. Um, so we are giving away this amazing Batman tumbler. And Mark, do you remember the theme song from Batman? Batman. Yeah, I don't know why you're playing bass. You should be the front man. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is let's all try to do the theme song from Batman. Wait, we're all going to do it together, and then I'm going to announce the winner. So one, two, three, four. Yannick Liff from DNV. Yannick, are you here? Hey. There he is. Yay, congratulations. Have fun checking that into your luggage. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Benjamin. And with that, we get to move on to my latest attempt at one of these weird lock note things. Um, we, I was just over at a table over there, and we were using ChatGPT to generate the abstract for next year's lock note, uh, which is going to be uh, the life and death of Tamagotchi. Is there a digital afterlife or something along those lines? Um, I'm just going to, you know, ChatGPT writes the abstract. I use. Uh, what's the thing, stable diffusion to generate the slides, and then just get up there and talk for 60 minutes easy. OK, so this is how JavaScript happened, a brief history of programming languages. This is the first time I've done this one. It's a work in progress. Uh, there will be a lot of corrections by the time I do it again at Copenhagen, because it'll go up on YouTube. And if you want people to correct you, then put yourself up on YouTube. Works fantastically. <laughs> um, but it is necessarily brief. I'm not going to dig in. Some of your favorite programming languages won't be there. And yes, how JavaScript happened is supposed to come with that subtext of, and how can we stop it happening again? <laughs> so in the before times, before there was programming and before there were computers, you want to talk about programming, you kind of have to start with Ada Lovelace, the first programmer. So Charles Babbage uh, went to the UK Parliament and got a million pounds, which was a lot of money in those days. These days, it'll buy you a potato, given the UK economy at the moment. But he went and he said, I'm going to build a, a difference engine. And they went, here's a million pounds. Go away and build the difference engine. So he went off, and he got about halfway through, and then he got bored and had a better idea. Uh, so he went back and went, give me two million pounds, I'm going to build an analytical engine. And they went, no, but he designed the analytical engine. And Ada Lovelace, Byron's daughter, so Lord Byron of the laudanum and syphilis and hanging out with Shelley and generally causing trouble, um, this was his daughter. And uh, she essentially invented a programming language for the analytical engine and then wrote a program in it to calculate Bernoulli numbers, whatever the hell those are. And that was in the late 19th century. And then nothing happened for about 60, 70 years. Um, and then this man came along, Alan Turing. So Alan Turing is kind of the, the godfather of programming and programmers. And Alan Turing, he was a mathematician, but he came up with the idea for the Turing uh, machine, the infinite state machine, and you feed paper into it, and it can rewrite the paper. And he proved mathematically that that could solve any problem. And then the Second World War started, and the Nazis were communicating using uh, the Enigma machines. and we had no idea what they were saying. And then the, some Polish people captured a U-boat and captured the Enigma machine off the U-boat. And then uh, Alan Turing went to Bletchley Park in the UK, and he built the bomb. 
um, which was actually also a Polish design, trying to give as much credit as possible where it belongs to, in, in this talk. Um, and they built this, and this cracked the Enigma code, and so we could understand what the Germans were saying. This was not a computer. This was a machine, and it just chunked through all the possible combinations of Enigma wheels and uh, patch cables and everything until it spat out what the current day's encryption code was. And then the Germans used this. This is the Lorentz cipher machine which is much more complicated and has many more permutations. And so Turing and a guy called Tommy Flowers, who worked for the post office, um, built Colossus, which was a bigger and more complicated computer that was intended to crack the Lorenz cipher. And it did, and it worked, but it still worked in roughly the same way. And so as with so many things, the computers and the world that we have today actually came out of this horrible conflict that, that happened in the middle of the 20th century. And one of the problems that they had uh, in, in America in particular, Americans don't like getting up close and fighting. They like sort of throwing things at you from as far away as possible. And so they wanted to say, if I throw this thing that weighs this, this hard, how far will it go and where will it land? And will it be close enough? No, I'm not going to go there. That's, that's just bad. Um, and so they built ENIAC, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. And the word computer, actually, when they were building ENIAC, that was a job title. That was Computers were usually women, and they would just add up big tables full of numbers and do multiplications and all this sort of thing and come out with the answer. And so they built ENIAC, and ENIAC, you didn't program it using a programming language. You programmed it using cables, and you linked this cable over to this thing, and it was like a switchboard, like one of the old switchboards that you see in black and white movies, and they're just linking things together to link different logic blocks together. And the people who built ENIAC hadn't bothered to document any of this stuff. And so the people who programmed ENIAC essentially just figured it out. They figured out what each of the different things did, and then they put the cables in, and they worked out the missile trajectory tables or whatever it might be. Um, these are the names of the ENIAC programmers. Uh, six of them, all women. OK. <laughs> and I'm just looking out now, and yeah. <laughs> Where did you all go? <laughs> So yeah, hi, all sitting down at the front. But no, programming, so building the hardware, building ENIAC was considered to be man's work, and uh, programming it, like actually putting in the things to make it do anything, was considered to be women's work. Um, and so for a while, we had these computers that you just configured to do a single job, and then you turned it on, and it ran for a bit, and it spat out the answer, and then you turned it off again. Um, and that actually took us quite a long way into the middle of the 1950s, the sort of early 50s, maybe. And then IBM released the IBM 701, and this was marketed as a calculator. This was not a computer. This was a calculator, and it was huge. And they used this for the same thing. I mean, they used it for lots of things. It was used for science. It was used for research. Um, it was used to uh, calculate the explosive uh, detonation range of nuclear bombs and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but basically, you took a very simple trajectory formula, like this one, where y equals x tan uh, theta. Oh, uh, minus g to the x to the 2, 2 v cos 2 theta. Yeah, I don't understand maths. I have no idea. I just never did maths beyond GCSE. But you had to take these formulas, and then you had to turn it in to machine code, because the 701 was one of the first sort of proper commercially available stored program computers. You could put a program in just kind of digitally and then run it. And these are the uh, opcodes. These are the ways that you told the CPU in the IBM 701. And you say CPU, we think of that these days as the little chip that sits in the middle. The CPU in those days was the entire room. 
and these were the opcodes that you would use. And so you would have to work out how to translate that formula into those opcodes to get the right thing out. And then you would literally use some little switches and set them on or off to the binary thing here and then push a button to load it into the machine and then do the next one and push the button and it would go into the machine. And if you made a mistake, you turn the machine off and start it again. Um, and that was how programming was done. Okay. So IBM followed up the 701 with the 704. Um, and I mean, this, this was an absolutely enormous computer. Um, no. <laughs> That's not actually an IBM 704. That's a model of an IBM 704. You can go and uh, find out about it at that web address. It's, it's, it's exquisite. Um, and while they were building the 704, before they started selling it, they hired a guy uh, called John Backus, John W. Backus. And John Backus, he'd done some mathematics. He'd done some engineering. He'd done some science and some physics and that sort of stuff. Um, and he got a job. He was wandering down the street in Manhattan one day, and he looked through the window, and IBM had the very first 704 kind of on display so people could see the flashing lights. And it actually had more flashing light. The flashing lights were added. They didn't do anything. Um, they were marketing. <laughs> IBM just thought people will stop and look if it's got flashing lights. And John Backer saw the flashing lights and went in and said, oh, what is it? What's, what's this for? And they told him. And he went, can I be a programmer? And they went, well, go upstairs and interview. And so he went upstairs and interviewed. And someone said, yeah, why not? And so he became a programmer because, yeah, why not? Um, but the important thing about John Backus, the thing that changed the world about John Backus is that he was a lazy, lazy bastard, okay? Bill Gates allegedly said, I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. And I honestly, as a lazy person myself, the effort I will put in to not doing something, it's insane. I will happily work an entire weekend without sleep and just coffee, just not to have to do something that would probably take five minutes. Just on the off chance that I might have to do it again next week. Um, so yeah, and so John Backus looked at the formulas and then he looked at the machine code and he just looked at the formulas again and then just, I'm not doing this for the rest of my life. I think I can write a program that will translate the formulas into the machine code. A formula translator, if you will. And with immense naming inventiveness, he called it Fortran. And it gives you an idea, this was like the Wild West days, because this was IBM, right? This was the, in two and a half years, we will deliver you a spec and a project plan company. And John Backer says, I want to make a programming language. And they said, what's a programming language? And he said, I'm not sure, <laughs> but it's going to be good. Can I build it? And they went, yes. And he went, can I have some people to help me build it? And they went, yes. And they gave him some people. And this was 1957. This was the year Sputnik 1 launched, OK? Um, and actually, the orbit of Sputnik 1's final stage uh, was calculated as one of the first programs run on an IBM 704 that uh, told them where the Sputnik stage 1 was going to come down. It's also um, where Sputnik 2 launched in the same year with Leica on board. Moment for Leica. That'll do. So yes. So Fortran was created by John Backus um, and these other people, Goldberg, Best, Herrick, Sheridan, Nutt, Nelson, Ziller, Stern, Height, and Sayer. And this is all of them, uh, most of them, some of them, but yep, that was a sort of meeting. Uh, they went away and they just hid 
in, in a room in IBM, and then IBM said, we need this room, go to that building. And so then they went to that building for a while, and they rented hotel rooms down the side there, and they invented something that had never existed before. They invented the programming language. This talk is actually quite heavy on Fortran, because when you're talking about how did JavaScript happen, you start with how did programming generally happen, and Fortran was the start. And so we, we, I'm going to talk about Fortran possibly a little bit more than the others. But yeah, they went in there. And there was a lot of snobbery um, at the time. See if this sounds familiar at all. Um, the people who were doing machine code programming, the people who knew and actually had memorized that big table of binary numbers and had got really good at flicking them and putting them in the machine and everything else, they went, oh, no. A programming will never be able to write machine code as well as I can write machine code. I mean, we've all kind of thought that ourselves at some point. Um, and so Bacchus and his team, their mission was to prove them wrong and actually to demonstrate that their programming language would generate better machine code than most programmers could create manually. So in a sense, Fortran, right from the start, the very first programming language to machine code compiler was already an optimizing compiler. And you know, these days, you look at Clang or GCC or whatever, the machine code that it generates, it's stuff that a human assembler programmer would probably never write, but it works because that's, that's how machines work. They just go, I know this will work. It may look ugly. I promise you this is faster. OK, so we're going to use FizzBuzz a lot through the course of this presentation. This is FizzBuzz in Fortran. Um, so if you don't know what FizzBuzz is, then you failed the interview. Um, but no, so FizzBuzz is actually a children's game. You sit around in a circle, and you go one, two, and then if the number can be divided by three, you say fizz. But if it can be divided by five, you say buzz. And if it can be divided by 3 and 5, or to put it another way, 15, uh, then you say fizz buzz. And so you go 1, 2, fizz, 4, buzz, uh, 5, fizz, 6, 7, no, 7, 8, but anyway. <laughs> I, I can't do that either. It's been a very long week. OK, so in Fortran, uh, we say program fizz buzz, and then we say do. Uh, 40, i equals 1, 20. So this says loop and uh, set i to 1, and then go incrementally up to 20, one at a time. Uh, and then when you get down to 40, do what's there. And then from 40, you will come back up to here. So I've done talks in the past where I've mentioned intercal. Um, so intercal is a, a, a made up, a, a ridiculous programming language, and it doesn't have go to, it has come from. That 40 in that line of Fortran there is essentially a come from. That's kind of going, this is where the loop ends. Fortran used line numbers, but you only actually needed to put line numbers in if you were either using them as part of a do loop like that, or if you wanted to go to them. So it wasn't like basic where every line had a number, it was just, these are, essentially, we're naming this line, except we just gave it a number. Um, and then we just go, so if uh, mod this, then print, and then that 8h fizzbuzz, that's how you say, put the next, uh, this number of characters out as text, um, and so it'll print fizz. And then we continue, which jumps down to 40, and then goes back up there. But we've got the if mod does not equal 0, then uh, 15 doesn't go to, doesn't equal 0, go to 20. Um, otherwise, print fizz buzz and continue. Then if mod 5 uh, doesn't equal 0, then go to 30. Otherwise, print buzz. Um, and mod 3, go, uh, print fizz, go to 40. And then 40 will either loop back round or it will print the number. Yay. OK, so fun things about this. Fortran had two variable types, integer and real, because it was for science and trajectories and that sort of stuff. And so they didn't need 
dates and times and all the sort of data types that we take for granted these days, they didn't actually need char. So char was just int. Um, and so when you put fizzbuzz in there, the Fortran compiler actually, during the compile process, turned those into the integer codes for each of those characters. It didn't have a way of declaring the type of the variable in the very first couple of versions of Fortran, 57 and 60. Um, so if a variable started with i, j, k, l, m, or n, it was an integer. Otherwise, it was real. Um, and so when you did loops in Fortran, you defaulted to, well, what's the simplest thing I can call an integer variable? I. And as far as I can tell, this is why even now in JavaScript and every other programming language in the world, we say for let i equal zero, i is less than whatever, i plus plus. It dates back to Fortran where we used i because that was an integer. We couldn't use a because that was real. And if you added, God knows what would have happened to it if you try to loop based on a real. Okay. Now, Fortran, the way it worked, um, this just makes me absolutely terrified. You, Fortran came on punch cards. Eventually, uh, or fairly quickly, because of the number of punch cards that the Fortran program took up, they switched to using tape, and so you would load a tape into the machine. But the very first, and all the time they were building it and testing it, so they wrote Fortran in machine code and then dumped that machine code out onto punch cards. Um, so you would feed the punch cards into the IBM 704, and then you would wait for it to sort of go, yep, I'm ready. And then you would feed the punch cards containing your Fortran program into the hopper, and it would go through all of those. And then it would either give you an error code saying, ha, <laughs> ha, 850 cards, and there was an error on number 849, go away. Um, and you would feed those in, and if your program was correct, it would compile it, and then it would dump your compiled program out on more punch cards over at the side there, and you would pick those up from the output hopper, and then you would go back to the start here, and then you would turn the machine off and on again to zero out the memory, and then you would feed your compiled program in, and it would run, and you would get the output. That was programming in 1957. And so every time I hear people go, oh, we need to optimize the inner loop, I kind of go, yeah, you really don't know you were born. Unless you are a JavaScript programmer and you have to do NPM installs on GitHub Actions public instances, in which case, yeah, fair play. This probably takes longer. Um, the, the hilarious thing here, so every single one of those cards is one line of code. Each column on that card is one character, and there are uh, 80 columns, and so you needed the first six were for the line number and kind of spacing, and so the longest a Fortran command could be was 74 characters. And so whatever you were doing uh, in a single operation, you had to fit it into 74 characters. And they used to draw these lines or draw things on the side of the deck of cards because if they got into the wrong order, you were essentially just screwed. That was it. I have no idea how to put this back in the right order. So, um, yeah, spare a thought for the Fortran programmers. Uh, this is factorial in Fortran. It's actually very simple, n equals 1, do 10, i equals 1, uh, n obviously can be an integer, i, j, k, l, m, n, um, so we say n equals 1, and then we do this loop uh, to 10, n equals n times i, and continue, and then print n. Um, so that will do factorial 9. Um, now, n times i, all the time they were building Fortran, they just used the times character because they weren't particularly bothered about what characters they had available to them. And IBM hadn't finalized the character set that was going to be available on the 704. 
And then when it came time to actually sort of start preparing this for release, IBM went, what's that? And they said, that's the time symbol. And IBM said, we don't have that. And they went, how are you going to do multiplication? And IBM went, I don't know. And so they had to find another character to use for multiply. And so they chose asterisk. So asterisk became multiply. And again, that's just, it, it's weird. You know, when you're a kid and you first learn programming and you go, how do you do multiplication? And you type 21x2 and the computer goes, no, that doesn't make any sense. And you go, how do you do multiplication? And someone goes, use the star. Because uh, you don't know when, what an asterisk is when you're eight. And so you go, where's the star? Shift seven. I can't really remember where the... Shift eight. Um, I don't look at the keyboard when I type. So yeah, so that's uh, Fortran introduced the idea of using the asterisk for, um, for the multiplication symbol. And so Fortran, I mean, if you boil it down for each of these languages, we're just going to go, what is there in JavaScript that came from this language? So Fortran, it's, I've kind of got these three items, but also the abstract concept of a programming language. And the importance of that cannot be overestimated. And I give a lot of credit to John Backus. Um, and it's an indicator of what an amazing job that small team of people did being shunted around various IBM offices in the 1950s that people still use Fortran today. You can go to Intel's website and download the Fortran compiler optimized for the latest Intel CPUs and the SSE instruction sets were implemented in Fortran before they ever made it into C or C++ or any other programming language. Fortran is still used, scientists in particular love it, and it still generates the fastest code of any high-level language compiler out there. So, good job, John, and everybody. So, yeah. But then, this chap came along, this is Edsger Dijkstra. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and he wrote a paper um, around the time of Fortran's release. He looked at Fortran, and he wrote a very famous paper and submitted it to some journal called Go To Considered Harmful. He did not like go to. Fortran, that was the only way you had of doing control flow. You had ifs and you had go tos. You had do and it would jump back up to there. But if you wanted to say, oh, go down here and do this, and you didn't have subroutines, you didn't have go sub, you didn't have functions or procedures or any of this sort of stuff. And Dijkstra did not like that. Incidentally, while I've been doing the research for this and more research for this talk than anything I've ever done in my life, I think I'm writing a book. Um, <laughs> I did see the for i equals, for j equals, for k equals. Uh, there is a, a, an urban legend that it comes from the ijk in Dijkstra's name. That's bollocks, it's Fortran's integers. But yeah, so Ed, Edsger Dijkstra, over his career, he said a lot of things. For example, he said, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes, which is kind of deep, I like that. Um, he said this, which I really like, if debugging is the process of removing bugs, then programming must be the process of putting them in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that probably is a good definition of a programmer. But he also said some things that may be not so good. Programming in basic causes brain damage. Um, also not a fan of COBOL. Uh, for similar reasons, he, he just really didn't like BASIC and, and COBOL and anything, really, I think. Um, but his go-to considered harmful. His point was that programming languages should be structured and we should organize our code in better ways and we should have, rather than having line numbers and go to and then go to back again and this sort of thing, we should have uh, blocks of code with structure and we should have named procedures or subroutines or uh, addresses that we could jump to and then that name would become part of the code. And so his ideas were uh, adopted by the Algol team. So Algol, in the same way that uh, formula 
translation became Fortran, Algol was the algorithmic language. And Algol, Fortran was Bacchus and his mates and a shifting team of people over time. And they were sitting in the room and they were building it and they were designing it and they were testing it all at the same time. Algol, uh, the second programming language, was designed by a committee. Um, quite a lot of it in Paris. And so they came up with a language that, to be fair, for something designed by a committee, is, it's not bad. Um, the first two or three versions didn't have I.O., because apparently there was nobody from printer companies on the committee, or so I don't know. Um, but it's, it's still pretty good, and it got a lot of these ideas right. So that's the, the people who were on the... Um, Algol committee, and you'll see on there that you've got Bacchus, uh, so he was brought in on there. We've also got McCarthy, we'll come back to him in a minute, um, and we've also got Nor. Um, and so you've got Bacchus and Nor, and you sort of think, why does that sound familiar? So the grammar that we still use today to describe programming languages, BNF, Bacchus, Nor, Form. So the first iteration of that was actually called Bacchus Normal Form, and it was done just by John Bacchus. And he created it just to describe Algol, so that it was a way that the Algol committee could sort of write down what... Kind of like OpenAPI and YAML files, but for programming languages. Sorry, that was a callback to my talk <laughs> earlier on. Um, and then Nor kind of worked with him and improved it for a second version. And I think it was actually Dijkstra who went, oh, you should call it Bacchus Nor form. Uh, and so, yeah, BNF, still use that today. So this is Fizzbuzz in Algol. Um, and you can see a couple of things here. So we have a begin and an end and a for and an end uh, and an if and an elif and an elif and an else. Um, and so we've got more structure coming in here, and we have no line numbers. We also have type declarations. So we say integer i before we start using it. So we're not sort of just going, if it starts with this letter, then it's this. and yeah. So we declare what that is. Um, and then uh, we have a few things in Algol. Algol is probably, um, you've got Fortran, the idea of programming and a couple of things. But in terms of actual stuff that went into later modern programming languages, Algol was probably the most influential one. Most languages have kind of adopted things from Algol. Um, so yes, we have semicolons at the end of lines, uh, some lines, not other lines. So that's very typical. Uh, we don't put it after a, a, a then, for example. Uh, we don't put a colon after it either. White space was insignificant in Algol, whereas it was quite significant in Fortran. Um, not very significant, it's kind of chaotic, but it did, it did uh, those first six characters, if they weren't there, your program would just go Pfft. Um, So yeah. Um, but we have an if and an elif and, and all this sort of stuff. And so uh, there's, there's things are starting to appear here that you sort of think, that's. I, I use a programming language today that still looks a bit like that. Um, so yeah, uh, essentially Algol gave us the idea of block structure. It gave us the idea of if then else, uh, which Fortran didn't really have. Fortran had if go to, if go to, if go to, if go to, and just jump on and do things. Um, Algol, the very first version of Algol actually had switch uh, built into it. So if you wanted to check something against multiple values, it had switch. It had four loops. It had functions. You could declare functions. Um, it had semicolons at the end of the lines. And it had Bacchus Nor form as the way of formally describing its grammar. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Algol gave rise to various other languages, which we'll look at as we go along. So this, speaking of Algol, is Tony Hoare. Uh, or C. Anthony Hoare, Sir C. Anthony Hoare, Fellow of the Royal Society and various other things. Um, and he worked on an Algol derivative called Algol W that had records. 
and references. And so he added, he sort of came up with the idea for those things in uh, Algol W, and that was the first thing that had records and had references to other records within records and all this sort of stuff. And so the thing that Algol W has contributed to JavaScript is, of course, null. Um, but, you know, where would we be without null? Probably on Mars. Okay, this guy who just looks like, you know, if I ended up back in 1955 and I needed to charge my time machine and get it back to the future, I would go looking for John McCarthy. This is the man. So John McCarthy worked at MIT and he worked in the AI lab at MIT with Marvin Minsky, who we have since discovered to be an extremely problematic individual. But John McCarthy, as far as we can tell, just decent stand-up bloke. And he had, he learned Fortran, and he kind of went, well, it's fine for the science stuff and, and that kind of thing. But I'm dealing more with artificial intelligence. I'm trying to prove that computers can think like human beings can think, because I have sorely underestimated how complicated thinking is. Um, but, you know... And he figured that the way we think is lists. And we have lists of stuff, and we prioritize things in lists, and then the thing that's at the top of the list is the most important thing, and so on and so forth. And so he created a language for list processing called Lisp, as opposed to Lisp, which is for list processing. Not quite sure if that's unacceptable. Is that like, like mocking people now or something? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so yes. So Lisp. Has anyone programmed in Lisp or Scheme or Closure? Yeah. So quite a few people. Yeah. You got any Lisp programmers sitting behind the stage? You're going. No, we're waiting for the next conference to start. We don't know who you are. Um, <laughs> but no. So Lisp. Uh, very interesting language. Um, if you've programmed in Lisp, um, somebody call out for me, what is the, uh, the operation name to get the atom off the start of a list? Car. What is the operation to get the remainder of that list? Why? Nobody knows. Okay. So, Lisp. John McCarthy implemented Lisp on the IBM 704. Now, one of the other things that's really wild about uh, computers prior to, I can't remember when it was, but we didn't have bytes and kilobytes. Nobody had decided that eight bits was going to be a byte and that we were going to work in multiples of eight. And so the IBM 704, it had the concept of a word, so a unit of data that the CPU could do something with, which was 36 bits. Um, <laughs> probably something to do with the way the memory system was made or something like that, but it had 36-bit words. And the way it was divided up for um, opcodes was you used the first three bits of the first half were a tag, a prefix tag, and then 15 bits was the address of the item in memory. And then you had another three-bit prefix. And then the second part was the index of the um, item to work on, which was actually calculated starting at the top of the memory and no, starting at the bottom of the memory and working up. So it was called a decrement register. Okay, so the first half was the address register, and the second half was the decrement register. And when John McCarthy implemented Lisp, he needed linked lists. And, the best, you know, if you implement a linked list in the simplest way possible, it's a single thing which contains the, uh, the current item and then a pointer to the next value in the list which will contain item number two and then a pointer. And so that's how he implemented lists. And so car is contents of the address register and kudder is contents of the decrement register. 
Technically, it's the address part of the register and the decrement part of the register. If anybody out there on Hello YouTube is going to try and correct me on that, because it's like there was 15 bits that, and all this sort of stuff. But yeah, he called it car and coulda because it was the content of the address register, content of the decrement register. And now, 70 years later, um, we are still using car and coulda for these operations in Lisp, and you're just kind of like, yeah, that is, that's an implementation detail bleeding through into the design. That's probably the best example I've ever seen of that. I had no idea, like I say, until I started researching this, I did not know that. So yes, Lisp by John McCarthy. Um, this is car and coulda. So car will give you Kirsty and Kudu will give you Jack, Jacob, Steiner, and Henriette. And I'm sorry if I couldn't fit anybody else on there. This is fizzbuzz in Lisp. So we define a function fizzbuzz, and we say loop for n from 1 below 101 do let divisible by 3. So this is the mad thing about Lisp. Um, its data structures and the language are the same thing. So it's just... It's a really, really simple. It's basically lots of round parentheses and lists of stuff. And those lists can be data, or they can be operations, or they can be input to operations. And you can put lists inside other lists. And it's, it's just absolutely nuts. And so to implement this, we talked, so we had a linked list. Um, so he had pointers to things going on in memory. And so to get this to work, he had to implement the heap. So Algol and Fortran both just used essentially a working chunk of memory, but it wasn't a heap as such. Lisp, he had to implement a heap. He had to implement an allocator. When you create a list, it will allocate some memory and assign it to that list. And so he also, if you wanted your program to keep running for any length of time, uh, had to have a garbage collector. And so this very first version of Lisp running on the IBM 704 in 1958 already had a garbage collector. John McCarthy didn't write it. I can't remember the name of the dude who did, um, but somebody wrote it for him. Um, and the other thing is because it's so flexible, you can do tortured things with Lisp. You can do really, really hairy things. And I don't think it was intended as a design feature, but he inadvertently invented first-class functions. Because if a function is a list, and you can put a list in a list, then you can put a function in a list. And if you can pass a list to a function, and that list's got a function in it, then you've invented first-class functions. You've invented functional programming. And so Lisp was the first functional programming language. And so from Lisp, we get functional programming and first-class functions, and we get the heap and garbage collection. And we're still in the 1950s. It's absolutely bonkers. And we really need to speed up. This talk needs some editing. OK, so I'm going to whiz through the rest of this quite quickly, because I've got, what, 10 minutes? Um, so, Simula. It does actually get quite quick from now on, because there's really not a lot left to invent. Um, so, similar, Ole Johan Dahl and Kristen Nygaard um, at the Norwegian Computing Center in Oslo. Yes, object-oriented programming was invented here in Oslo. Round of applause for them. So this is Fizzbuzz in Simula, and we have a class, and we have refs, and we have this sort of uh, this stuff going on here. We have procedures inside classes. Um, so Simula was created to literally to create simulation code. And the point that they had is, if I want to simulate multiple bodies interacting in a system, then wouldn't it be great if I could wrap each of those bodies up as, as a self-contained thing and then just see how it interacts with other things? And so object-oriented programming actually came out of this desire to simulate multiple things interacting within a system. Um, and so we got lots of stuff from Simula. We got classes, inheritance, polymorphism, and scope as well. The idea of having private, protected, internal, whatever your different scope options are in your programming language of choice. So Simula, lots of people think Smalltalk was the first object-oriented programming language. It wasn't. It was Simula. Um, it took some ideas from weird things people had done with Algol, and obviously Algol W with its records, but Simula was the first object-oriented language. 
Then along came Kenneth Iverson. He's, I love Kenneth. Um, he was a teacher, he was teaching programming, um, and he wanted a, a language just for teaching programming. And so he created APL, which stands for a programming language. <laughs> Apparently he was also really good at cache invalidation. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he created APL. Here he is drawing Cox on a blackboard. Oh dear, it's been a long week. Um, <clears throat> this is FizzBuzz in APL. It's, it's an insane language, okay? Um, it had a lot of weird Greek symbols and stuff in it, but FizzBuzz, the, the cool thing about APL is when you do an operation, you can say, do it on all the elements of this array at the same time. And so it can do bonkers things. There are people these days, they work in finance and they use an APL derived language uh, that I can't remember the name of, it's K or something like that. Um, and uh, when they write their high-frequency trading algorithms to go and be evil in Wall Street, um, they use a, an APL-derived language to do that. You think this is bad, right? That's FizzBuzz. Obviously, FizzBuzz has to contain FizzBuzz, Fizz and Buzz in there for it to work. So at the, the useful bit of it is contained in about eight characters at the end there. Um, that is actually Conway's Game of Life in its entirety in APL. That's the whole program. It's just insane. The most insane thing about it is that this is the keyboard. Um, if you're one of these people who builds your own mechanical keyboards, you can order APL keycaps for it and then you can download APL and you can actually program in it like that. But the thing that APL actually introduced that nothing had done before was dynamic typing. So if you declare a variable in APL, it's an array of stuff and you can set an element in that array to be whatever the hell you like. You can set it to be a real, and then next time round you can say now it's an integer, next time round you can say now it's a character. Um, so APL gave us dynamic typing, which obviously JavaScript picked up and ran with, uh, along with some scissors. <laughs> okay, so going back to Algol, the next sort of series of things that came out of Algol were um, BCPL, um, or no, CPL, then BCPL, and then B. Um, so BCPL, Batch Control Processing Language, created by Martin Richards. Here's Martin Richards, he was at Cambridge University, and he created BCPL, which was derived from Algol, but made uh, a little bit easier to work with. And you can see here that we've got a for i equals one to 100 do. It basically looks a lot like Algol. He got rid of the semicolons. He didn't like the semicolons and somebody else brought them back. Um, but the one thing that he had was this idea of libraries. So at this stage, by the time we got to um, this era, the 1960s, we had terminals, we had storage, you could have libraries just on the disk and then you could import them. And so BCPL introduced this idea of saying, import a, a library for me. Um, and BCPL was the first language that used curly braces uh, for de denoting blocks instead of begin and end. Didn't use them for all stuff, so test still had then on the end, he didn't sort of figure that one out. Problem was that curly braces weren't in 7-bit ASCII and most things in those days were using 7-bit ASCII and so you could substitute the curly braces for dollar open paren and dollar close paren and that would work just as well. But if you had curly braces available to you, you could use curly braces so BCPL gets those. Then Ken Thompson created B. Ken Thompson was a dude. In the 19, late 60s and, and the 70s, Ken Thompson, along with Dennis Ritchie and uh, Kernighan, uh, created the Unix operating system. Um, here is uh, Ken Thompson there on the right with Dennis Ritchie. Uh, just hardcore programming dudes at Bell Laboratories. Uh, in the 1970s. Uh, Ken Thompson, so B inspired C, which Dennis Ritchie wrote, um, but never really made it as a language on its own. Um, but Ken Thompson obviously also created Unix, uh, along with some other people. He personally, individually created Ed, which was the forerunner to VI. If you think VI is hard, try editing text with Ed a line at a time. Uh, Grep was a personal utility that he wrote for himself until someone went, Ken, that would be really useful. 
can you share it? And he copied it into slash bin. Um, and then he went away for a bit. And then in the noughties, he turned up at Google and helped design Go. So yes. So B didn't really lead to much except C. So Dennis Ritchie created C. And when I was a junior programmer, and you, want, you turned up to work, and they said, learn a useful programming language, because all I knew was Amiga Basic. And they went, here, Blue Book, learn that. And you learn C. And you learned how to write Hello World. First uh, Hello World example as a way of writing um, code. So that was the C program. That's where Hello World comes from. Um, but C, we have uh, curly braces, we have the include, we have semicolons, we have all that good stuff. Um, and so uh, that is fizzbuzz in C. Um, now, one of the things we all know about C is that you can do some very interesting things with it. So there you go, that's also fizzbuzz in C. Um, but the main thing that C added, brought to the world, so before C went BCPL and B and all this sort of stuff, we were still saying for I equals 1 to 10, do this sort of thing. C introduced this idea of the three statement for loop. So for initialize the variable, uh, test the variable, do something to the variable. Um, so that came from C. Then, in 1972 as well, uh, Smalltalk came along. So Smalltalk uh, came out, was written by Alan Kay and Dan Ingalls and Adele Goldberg, and it came out of uh, Palo Alto Research Center, or Xerox Park. And Smalltalk was kind of the second object-oriented language, except Alan Kay has often said, I wish I hadn't called it object-oriented, I wish I'd called it message-oriented programming, because that was much more the point, but he didn't, and so here we are. Thanks. <laughs> um, but Smalltalk worked really well with the other thing that was being invented at Xerox Park at the time, which was the idea of the GUI, of a, of a programming environment, an application environment, where things didn't happen one after the other, and you had to respond to events. And this idea of objects that passed messages between each other and responded to them fit very well with that idea of um, the, the graphical user interface. So just for fun, here is uh, Fizzbuzz in Smalltalk. Um, and uh, it's, it's weird. Um, if you've ever done Objective-C, uh, that took quite a lot from Smalltalk. Um, I used to say in a different talk that Objective-C took the best parts of C++ and the best parts of Smalltalk and threw them away. Um, <laughs> but yes. So Funky thing with Smalltalk that you see in JavaScript as well is integer was defined in the system runtime, but you could extend it um, at, in your own code. So you could go, I'm going to add a fizzbuzz function to the integer type. I'm going to tell the integer how to respond to a fizzbuzz message. And here it is. This will do it. Um, and so yeah, the other thing that came, and this is from uh, Wikipedia, um, everything in Smalltalk is an object. Classes are objects. Uh, a class is an instance of a meta class, which is also an object. Everything's an object. It's objects all the way down, floating around in space on the back of four objects, on the back of a much larger object, and just hurtling towards oblivion. Um, and code blocks, which has anonymous functions, are also objects. But it also introduced the idea of anonymous functions. OK, so Smalltalk gave us lots of things. Smalltalk had a virtual machine that it ran on. So it created an environment for your code to run in. Uh, that meant it could have reflection, and it meant they could build a bunch of tools into that environment, including something like a console, so a debug area, and this idea of everything being an object. So Smalltalk. Then we have ML, ML, machine language. Um, this was an iter a sort of evolution of functional programming. Uh, this is Fizzbuzz in ML. And the main thing that came from ML that went into JavaScript is the arrow function, the lambda thing there. Um, so arrow function syntax. Then we get uh, Scheme. Scheme was a variant of Lisp, a much simpler variant of Lisp that was created at uh, MIT by Sussman and Steele. Uh, to support their CS601 uh, course on programming. 
Um, Scheme, there's nothing really from Scheme that wasn't in Lisp that has made it in. The main reason it's in the presentation is because JavaScript was originally implemented as a scheme. And then it was only when Java sort of started to rise in popularity that Netscape went, Brendan, make it look like Java. And he went, ah, oh, it's finished. So, yes. Uh, that's FizzBuzz in Scheme. It's essentially a simpler and nicer version of Lisp. Then we got C++ by Bjorn Straustrup. So shout out to any Danish people. Both of them. You thought there were more of you, didn't you? <laughs> so yeah, Bjorn Straustrup uh, basically went, ah, oh, C's not complicated enough. Um, <laughs> This, this is actually a quote from him. C makes it easy to shoot yourself in the foot. C++ makes it harder, but when you do, it blows your whole leg off. Um, so this is FizzBuzz in C++. The main thing that we got from C++, so languages had had exceptions and exceptional behavior and that sort of stuff before. Um, C++ was the first thing that called it try, catch, and throw. Um, and had the concept of a typed error, so you could catch different types of error in order. So that came from C++. Right back to Algol, you had the ability to kind of raise an error condition. You couldn't deal with it anywhere. It just set some lights up on the, on the machine. But um, yeah, that was that. Um, who's ever heard of a programming language called Self? Yeah, no, me either, until I... There is a programming language called Self. Apart from anything else, my God, that's hard to Google. <laughs> programming Self, here's some Python. Um, so yeah, but no, Self was created by David Unger and Randall Smith. It was kind of a small talky sort of thing, but instead of classes, it had this new idea for how to do object-oriented programming based on prototypes. So you wouldn't have a class, you'd have a prototype, and then when you wanted to create an instance, you'd just copy that prototype. Sound familiar? Yeah. Um, it's still, people are still making it. There's like a Self 2017 on their website or something. Um, I could not find FizzBuzz in Self. Like I say, really hard to Google, but this is what its object-oriented thing looked like. So animal is an empty object, and then dog is an object where the parent is animal, and so is cat, and then lab is an object where the parent is dog, and so forth. So self is where the idea of prototype-based object orientation came from. Although they kind of were inspired by the thing on doing object-oriented programming in Scheme from SICP. And if you want to know how that works, read the damn book. But yeah, they've got a website. Latest version, 2017.1. Download now. No. So then, of course, there was Java. Java was created by James Gosling at Sun in the uh, 90s. And the first use of Java was to create applets that you embedded in your web page. And when you wanted to make it so that when they put the mouse over a button, the background color changed, you wrote a goddamn Java applet. And you did weird things with RGB. Um, and so this was how we got the idea that web pages could be interactive in the first place. This is, I mean, this isn't a realistic implementation of, of FizzBuzz in Java because there's no Fizz Factory, no Buzz Factory, and no FizzBuzz Factory Manager. Um, but it's something like that. Okay. And then we got JavaScript. And JavaScript has been inspired by all these different things, taken these ideas from all these different places, and has congealed them together in one unholy mess that I regret deeply. And, you know, time machines, Hitler, maybe Mussolini. I wouldn't kill Brendan Eich. I, I would honestly, no, I have nothing against Brendan Eich. Um, I would just sort of go to. Netscape maybe like six months before they asked him to build it and I would say Brendan in six months time they're going to ask you to throw together a quick programming language uh, to like as a demo feature for Netscape Navigator 2.0 just a heads up in 2023 it's going to be the most widely used programming language in the world please can you put integers in it So yeah, again, I, I've been thrown by things while researching this so many times. Netscape Navigator, of course, it came in a box because you couldn't go on the internet to download it because you didn't have a web browser. 
It was, it was the boots that you had to go to like Best Buy or, or wherever and like buy a copy of Netscape Navigator on multiple floppy disks and take it back and install it on Windows 95. It was mad. Um, so yes, now there is one addendum to this which I'm going to throw in there because there's a lot of .NET people here. Um, and so there was another language which was inspired by C++ which was C Sharp. <laughs> no, okay, it was inspired by Java. Um, <laughs> And uh, that was Anders Halesberg. These days it's maintained by Mads Torgerson um, and a whole bunch of people, super smart people. My favorite programming language and I've used a lot and it's still my favorite and I still love what they're doing to it. Uh, this is Fizzbuzz in modern C++ where we're just doing horrible switchy things and pattern matching. And so we can create a tuple with the modulus N3 and modulus N5 and then switch against that tuple and do multi-value things and my time is up. So C Sharp, the main thing that's gone from C Sharp into JavaScript was async and await. And so that is how we get from Fortran to JavaScript. I'll time it better next time. Honorable mentions, there's all the programming languages that didn't make it into this talk and I swear to God that actually was all of them. Um, one last note, if I've been mean about any languages, this is Flon's axiom. There does not now, nor will there ever, exist a programming language in which it is the least bit hard to write bad programs. So take that with you out into the world. Thank you very much for coming and staying for my little talk at the end. And thank you to everybody at NDC. Thank you, Kirsty, for starting this whole thing, Jacob for organizing things, Henriette, Heather, Steiner, Magnus, all those people. Thank you, all the technical people who do the sound and the video screens and everything else. Thank Thank you the caterers and the serving staff who've been keeping us fed and watered for all this time. Thank you to all the sponsors that mean our tickets cost less than $10,000 each. And thank you all for coming and making this conference what it is. Maybe see you in Copenhagen. If not, maybe see you back here next year. Thank you.